Thank you. Oh, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to step in the place of Phil Blake, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Oh. Oh. Okay. Thank you, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak and to speak on behalf of Phil Blake, who unfortunately couldn't be here. As she indicated, my name is Julie Corcoran, and I'm appearing today on behalf of Bayer and more than 14,000 dedicated employees across the United States. Bayer expects growth in the pharmaceutical sector will continue to be driven by emerging markets such as China, Brazil, Russia, and India. Accordingly, India's industrial policies and their negative impact on Bayer's business plans are particularly troubling. I am pleased to have this opportunity to provide the Commission with a case study of how India's industrial policy has harmed one U.S. company. After briefly describing the challenge that biopharmaceutical research companies like Bayer face, I will describe how the government of India has pursued its industrial policy to the detriment of our own company. Through a tax on intellectual property rights, as evidenced by India's treatment of Nexavar, and price setting that discourages innovation. Moreover, given India's size and its influence in the region and beyond, there is a real risk that if left unchecked, India's industrial policy will be replicated in other markets in which Bayer currently competes. On, on any given day, you are likely to see a headline in a newspaper that announces a scientific breakthrough that is expected to lead to a cure or new, new treatment for a particular illness. Last year, Time Magazine published a cover sto story entitled, How to Cure Cancer. Fifteen years earlier, the New York Times had attributed the claim that cancer would be cured within two years to Nobel Prize winner James Watson. In 2003, the then director of the National Cancer Institute boasted that the NCI would eliminate suffering and death from cancer by 2015. Even when such predictions have not come to pass, in most cases, there was a sound scientific basis for making them. Today, in research labs across the world, scientists are working on ideas for new treatments. Yet to know which of these ideas will become an approved drug tested extensively for safety and efficacy, we would have to meet again in 10 or 15 years. The fundamental challenge that innovative pharmaceutical companies face is that, no matter how promising and sound these ideas are today, most have to be abandoned. That may happen early on during the development, but can also happen years after years of research or even in the last clinical trials. And yet, even when a new drug is ready, being able to launch it typically, typically requires a complicated, often lengthy, and expensive process in every country where a company wants to sell it. For all the time, expenses, and efforts associated with this work, we must also contend with the reality that a successful new product can often be copied relatively inexpensively. It is for these reasons that the investments needed to fund the journey from idea to innovation to an approved new drug will only take place if this innovation is incentivized. The current IP system does so by protecting the fruits of innovation against copying by those who do not incur this cost and risk. IP is the lifeblood of the biopharmaceutical industry, and it is the patent system, not its absence, that best serves the needs of the public. Conversely, lax or non-existent IP protection poses a threat to both patients and innovators. The notion that there exists a tension between IP and access rests on a fundamentally flawed premise. Both patent, patented and off-patented medicines play a critical role. Today's generics are the innovative products of the previous generation, and today's innovations will be the next one, genetics. <clears throat> Were it not for the IP system and the efforts and risks undertaken by our companies, there would be no discussion of access. Not because there would be no patents, but because there would be no new drugs. As a critical incentive for innovation, IP has been a key tool in developing the, arm, <coughs> the environment that has led to in today's medicines and transformed global health. New cancer drugs developed with the incentives of IP account for 50 to 60 percent of the increase in age-adjusted survival rates since 1975. Recent studies from 2002 and 2004 show improvements in treatments have helped cut cancer death rates in half. This brings me to our experience with Nexavar. Nexavar is a life-extending oncology drug that is used to treat advanced stages of kidney and liver cancer. And just recently, in November 2013, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved Nexavar's use in treating certain forms of thyroid cancer. 
With sales of a billion dollars worldwide, this medicine is critical to Bayer's business. While the research and development on the drug was conducted here in the United States, Bayer USA secured patent protection on serafinib, the underlying compound in Nexavar, in various countries, including India, beginning in 1999. Nexavar was first approved for marketing in India in 2007. In July, two, I'm sorry, in 2000, I said 2007. In July 2011, an Indian manufacturer, NACO, filed an application with the Indian Controller General of Patents to compel Bayer to issue a license to permit NACO to manufacture and market Nexavar. These proceedings resulted in a decision in March 2012 to grant a compulsory license on specific terms to NACO. Bayer appealed, and in March 2013, the Indian Intellectual Property Appellate Body rejected Bayer's appeal, upholding the compulsory license and ordering NACO to pay only 7% of its net sales from the drug to Bayer. The impact of the compulsory license on Bayer is evident. Our competitors in India have prospered through India's industrial policy, which requires local production. While our annual revenue in India from sales of Nexavar, a groundbreaking medicine with sales of over a billion globally, has been driven down to a very small amount. Bayer's experience in India is hardly unique among research-based pharmaceutical companies with significant U.S. activities. But India's actions are not merely commercially detrimental, these actions are also inconsistent with India's obligations under WTO TRIPS agreement. The granting of compulsory licenses cannot solve the problems facing the Indian health system. Investment in the research and development of both innovative drug products and future therapies can only be financed through patent rights. In addition to compulsory licensing, the Indian government's failure to take patents into account when approving generic medicines has also aided and abetted the infringement of Bayer's patents. For example, since March 3, 2008, when Bayer was granted a patent for Nexavar, the Drug Controller General of India approved generic versions of serafinib for local Indian producers on three separate occasions. To compound the lack of patent protection at the regulatory level, whether by design or simply as a result of in inadequate resources, the Indian courts have consistently delayed justice in patent infringement cases further exacerbating the impact of India's industrial policy on Bayer and other global companies. Indian judicial proceedings are fitfully slow, requiring multiple hearings and without timely resolution. In addition to the fundamental challenges we face when it comes to our ability to defend our intellectual property in India, India's policies for setting pharmaceutical prices further damage our efforts to bring innovative medicines to the marketplace. For many years, India used a narrowly defined cost plus approach to set the maximum price for some of the medicines on its national list of essential medicines. As detailed in my pre-hearing statement, India's cost plus, cost plus approach was doomed to failure, as it assumed that there were few costs associated with bringing drugs to market other than the price of their raw materials. It is worrying that no pro-innovation proposals have emerged in recent discussions to reform the system. The Indian model that I have described today offers an appealing, if misguided, alternative for many countries with significant health care needs. For example, the South African government recently released a draft policy designed to amend the country's IP regime. South Africa proposes to adopt a number of India's practices, including extensive pre- and post-grant opposition, as well as a renewed commitment not to adopt regulatory data protection, nor to allow for patent term restoration in cases of regulatory delays. As the draft policy makes several explicit references to the Indian experience in justifying these changes, there can be no argument about the driving forces behind these proposals. There is no doubt that governments, generic competitors, and civil societies are watching both India's actions and other countries' reactions. If left unchecked, India's policies would create great harm for U.S. companies and the U.S. economy. In conclusion, I urge the Commission in its report to Congress to draw upon the experience of our company to illustrate the dangers that India's industrial policy represents. Thank you. Thank you.